today, and uh, I'd like you all to come to all of it. And welcome, everybody. Real pleasure to have everybody here and to have such a good crowd. Uh, the way this is going to work, I'm going to do um, some overhead. We're going to uh, kind of do this um, very, since we're talking about the future, we're going to do this very retro presentation. Remind you all of the third grade and we're going to have to for about five minutes. Uh, and my purpose is actually to do about 130 years of telecom history in five minutes and see if I succeed. But really to set the stage for what our major speakers will really be talking about. The way this is designed is to have all kinds of different points of view. Um, the, the, the question for today uh, is why is VOIP not your parents' plain old telephone service sometimes in those pots? And so to understand that, we're going to do a little bit of history here. Just, just while well, Blair's getting set up, I want to recognize Congressman Cole and welcome Congressman. If you want to come up and make some comments on the issue. Good to be here. I'm going to have to leave before too long. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much. Um, preliminary matter. Can everybody can everybody hear me? I'm not sure this mic is working, but if you can, if if, you, if the voice starts to fade, just raise your hand in the back. Um, it, be, before we start going through the kind of the, the, the networks, let's just talk real quickly about the goals of telecommunications network regulation. Um, my friend Randy May, who's in the audience, uh, I, I sometimes think the purpose of regulation is so that Randy and I. Uh, have something to talk about at lunch, uh, which we've been doing for over 10 years, and um, I think a lot of people in this room have been talking about it. But that's actually not the purpose of, of regulation. The real purpose, um, I think, really comes in three categories. First, universal service. And the universal service really is broken down into three things. Number one, the network should be built out everywhere. Number two, everybody should afford it. It should, it should be affordable for everyone to be on the network. And three, and I think this is sometimes not as well understood, the network should be interoperable. Um, in some form or fashion, though that's always a subject of some debate. Secondly, there is a category of regulation which really relates to the fact that the network has characteristics of what people think of as a natural monopoly. And so for many years we thought it was a monopoly and therefore had to be regulated like a monopoly um, uh, and, and like other, other utility monopolies. Uh, in 1996 the paradigm changed and so uh, it could be regulated for competition uh, but as we can see, that what really wasn't the first time it was regulated in that way. But that's a whole other second category. And the third category is there are certain social policies that the network should serve. For example, it should serve the public safety uh, social policy by allowing um, the network to be wiretapped. That's something which is not the subject of today, but is a major concern of folks here. But there are other concerns, such as allowing disability access, etc. So having said that, uh, let's take a look at, um, this is something of an oversimplification, but basically the point is you have a telephone, here's the network architecture. A telephone is connected to a local loop or a local access. It goes through a switch, which is the X. It goes over a backbone, comes out of a switch some other place, goes back on a local loop, and is then connected to the phone. And in 1913, um, we're skipping about 50 years. Uh, in 1913, the United States government and what was the predecessor at AT&T came to an agreement and said, we'll grant you this monopoly over this kind of network, um, but you have to serve all of our goals. And it was pretty simple. Universal service could be um, funded simply by having business users subsidize residential users, long distance users subsidize local users, and urban users subsidize rural users. And all the costs were contained within that network, so it was an internal subsidy. Uh, and the other goals could be achieved very easily simply by saying, AT&T, here's what you must do. Um, so this all worked fine. And then in, uh, uh, there were a number of developments, but let's just take it in 1969. Uh, a critical step was that the consumer premises equipment, which we think of as the phone, was unbundled, but the rest of the network uh, stayed with AT&T. But the purpose of, of that ruling, which was called the Cardiphone ruling, was to uh, incentivize uh, innovation at the edge of the network. And then in 1984, with the breakup of AT&T, we actually broke up the network, so you had the CPE, uh, had already been deregulated. You had the loop and the switch belonging to the bells. 
you had the backhaul belonging to what are now called the Inter Exchange Carriers AT&T MCI Sprint, and then it goes um, that then continues on. So that's the basic structure of the network. Um, uh, and then in the 1996 Act, there were a couple of methods of competition that were uh, discussed, one of which is called facilities-based, where you have two networks, and as you can see, you simply have a, a second network that needs to interconnect to the first network. And then an intra-platform version of competition, sometimes called total, sale, um, uh, total service resale, and also referred to uh, sometimes as unis. And the unis are the unbundling. I've, I've written this, the local network is being simply a local loop in the switch. This will surprise you. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. But there are a number of elements to it that, um, that are unbundled. And of course, this is a subject of enormous debate, even all these years after the act. Uh, big court decision a couple weeks ago. Um, big question about whether this c case will go forward to the Supreme Court. But fundamentally, that's a different version of competition. Um, but now we get to how the network looks today. And putting aside the intra-platform, I want to focus on various facilities-based players um, and talk about the critical question of intercarrier compensation. And the reason this is critical is, uh, as Willie Sutton said, it's where the money is. Because universal service is funded not just by an explicit tax on the, uh, the long distance revenues, which are the revenues collected by the long distance carriers who sit in the middle, they're also funded by what are called intercarrier compensation or access charges. And that's the amount that the um, the, the network at the end of the call charges the other network for connecting to their customer. Um, and this is a matter both of universal service policy and it's also a matter of competition. What we have today is a situation which, um, if I were to call Tim in Virginia and I'm living in Maryland, I make the call over the local loop, Verizon, uh, char uh, then, uh, then I go on to a backbone uh, let's call it AT&T, then we connect to a local loop in Virginia. Uh, Verizon charges AT&T what's called originating access, and then Verizon in Virginia charges AT&T what's called terminating access. Okay? And then AT&T adds those things together with their own charges and charges me a certain amount of money. However, using a similar network, if I were to send Tim an email, I go on a, on a dial-up um, basis. I'm on my computer, which is the box. I don't get charged any originating access. I go through the internet cloud and I don't get charged any terminating access. And the reason is, is that data is considered what's called an enhanced service provider. And so even though it's using a similar network, uh, it is charged a different amount. If I were to call him on a wireless phone, um, what, what the, uh, my wireless carrier would be charged an amount called reciprocal compensation, which is a market negotiated rate, and generally speaking is much, much lower than terminating access. Um, and then if I were to call from a CLEC, that's a competitive local exchange carrier, so we're all stay we're staying kind of in a local region, again, the, the amount would be the much lower reciprocal comp. Now, there's an awful lot of discussion about how VOIP gets regulated, but at the end of the day, a lot of this discussion relates to these questions of what are the charges for, um, for interconnecting. Um, and right now, there are um, three basic modes of voice over IP. Uh, the first mode would be what we call computer to computer. And that is where uh, examples of this would be pulver.com. They would be when you're talking about vocal uh, voice instant messaging. There's a company called Skype, um, uh, which offers this kind of service. It doesn't touch the public switch telephone network. It doesn't use telephone numbers. It just is a, you're, you're going over a broadband pipe through the internet cloud to another computer. Um, and it's pure IP. This was the subject of an FCC proceeding which was decided last month 
called Pulver.com, and the FCC decided it should not be regulated at all, and it's not subject to any access charges, nor is it subject to any kind of universal service obligation. Um, a second category is what we might think of as phone to phone. This is where you start with a regular phone, you go over a local loop, but then in the, in the backbone, in the network, it gets transmitted into something uh, that's database, that's IP. And so it is voice over IP, but only in the middle of the call, not at the end. This is the subject of, of AT&T's petition. Uh, that is currently pending at the FCC. Three commissioners have already announced publicly that they believe that this call still should be subject to terminating access charges. And so the FCC is essentially saying this is going to be treated the way we treat regular phone calls and we're not treating it like a voice over IP call, but it's, th th that decision has not yet come out. The third and probably the most um, the most contentious and the most uh, interesting, and to some extent, is what we might think of as computer to phone, where you start off on your computer or using your broadband, but, but making a voice communication, going through bro a broadband connection over the internet cloud, but ending up on the public switch network and talking to somebody uh, on the public switch network. And the big question there being, again, what should it be subject to going back to the goals of regulation? Something like that. Should it be subject to any kind of universal service charges, um, other kinds of taxes and fees? Uh, secondly, is there any other kind of regulation related to the kind of the monopoly or pro-competition regulation that we have historically done? And third, what kind of uh, social obligations should it be subject to? Should it be subject to the wiretap obligations? Should it be subject to the disability access? Um, under the 96 Act, there basically were, there, were the, the, there was a concept of telecommunication service and there was a concept of information service. And what voice over IP in some sense really is, is that architecturally um, it is very similar to an information service, but in terms of functionality, in terms of what you are doing, it's very similar to telecommunications uh, service. So that's kind of the background on the network architecture, again, from our perspective, which is that of of an analyst for Wall Street, um, we're looking at the intercarrier compensation issues as being most important. Uh, I would simply note that there are a variety of solutions that one could come up with on intercarrier compensation, but they all involve, in addition, having to reform universal service because uh, almost anything that you do undercuts the current information service, I mean, the, the, the current universal service framework. So those two categories of issues intercare compensation and universal service, and particularly the impact of universal service on rural America and rural connectivity are probably the thorniest and, and, and trickiest issues uh, that I think the government faces in trying to essentially accomplish the same goals that it was trying to accomplish in 1913, which is make sure that all Americans are on the network, the network is built out everywhere, everybody can afford it, and there is interconnection between the different networks. Um, so, that was 150 some years um, of, of telecommunications regulation. With that, let me introduce Tom Eslin. Did I pronounce your last name correct? Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, Tom is the uh, chairman and, and chief executive officer of IPXC Corporation, uh, which he founded in 1997. And he's one of the, uh, the leading advocates uh, for those who are uh, providing voice over internet services, sometimes called uh, VOIP. And uh, with that, I'd like Tom to just discuss for a few minutes what the potential is and uh, how he thinks the government ought to handle it. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, that's a great job of 150 years history in seven minutes. Uh, I'll try to talk a little bit about recent history and the future. Um, there's not only potential for voice over IP, it's actual. It's just invisible in the United States. In fact, 10% of international calls are already voice over IP calls. The reason people don't know that is these are phone-to-phone -phone calls, as Blair described. And voice over IP is only in the middle of the call. But in the last four years, this new technology, mainly in the hands of small companies, has taken over 10% of all international traffic. My company, ITXC, is the market leader in that, 
as Blair said, we started in 97, so it shows how low the barriers to entry are and how new businesses can be built very quickly. The important effect isn't that we can start a business quickly. Um, the important effect is that in that period, international calling rates have come down about 70%. The poorest nations in the world have been able to connect to the richer nations, have been able to integrate their economies to a degree they weren't able to before because voice over IP has opened the way to cheaper communication. That 10% figure is a worldwide figure. It's much, much larger in the developing world because one of the reasons ways that voice over IP is much more efficient than the PSTN is in capital cost. And of course, in the developing world, in fact, in rural areas in the United States, capital is everything, and there isn't a whole lot of capital to go around. Um, so voice over IP has already had a tremendous <coughs> impact, um, but it's been an impact that's almost invisible because the people who are using it only know that their phone calls are cheaper, and it doesn't matter to them why. It shouldn't matter to them why. Uh, but now voice over IP is becoming visible because it's moving all the way back to the customer premises. And the only correction I'd make to all that Blair talked about is it's not really computer to phone or computer to computer anymore. It's a special kind of computer called an IP phone which happens to look exactly like a phone that's being used when there's this broadband access. In fact, if you go to the Commerce Department and you look closely at their telephones, they all say Cisco. Uh, and they say Cisco because they put in a voice over IP system. The phone looks like a phone, it acts like a phone, people talk on it like a phone, but it isn't connected to any phone network, it's connected to an IP network. Uh, when people buy service from Vonage, who've gotten a great deal of publicity lately, they're using an IP phone, either to talk to other people who have one of those phones, or to talk to ordinary telephones. There are already four million subscribers in Japan who have IP phones and get the advantage of much cheaper telephony, and not only to talk to other people with IP phones, but to talk to everybody else who has an ordinary phone. So there have been huge benefits and will continue to be huge benefits, not only in greater capability, um, but in lower prices. Um, those benefits and moving quickly are in a strange way dependent on the phone-to-phone -phone industry because the phone-to-phone -phone industry has built out the connections between the internet and the traditional phone network. And if you think about it, in order for an IP phone, like the one in Commerce Department, to be of any use for anything other than inter-office calls, there have to be connections to all of the other phones in the world. I believe that by 2010, all calls will be on the internet, but between now and then, we're going to go through a huge transition where the more and more calls are between the IP network and the phone network, and that has to be built out. Um, quickly. Uh, the position of the Vaughn Coalition is that the voice over IP doesn't need to be regulated and uh, or re should be regulated very, very lightly. Um, and just to go quickly to Blair's three points, it's exactly in that context. One, universal service. One, vo voice over IP has made calling much, much cheaper. Therefore, it decreases the burden on the universal service fund. It's not that providers of voice over IP shouldn't contribute to the Universal Service Fund, uh, but the Universal Service Fund, Blair says, its funding mechanism is falling apart. It needs to be reformed. Everybody needs to be contribute to contribute to it. And meanwhile, voice over IP itself is doing an enormous amount to make communications more accessible, not only in the developing world, but in rural areas of the United States where costs would be even higher if it were not for voice over IP. Second reason for regulation was to regulate monopolies. Voice over IP, since you don't have to own the network, my company doesn't own any network, we use the internet, has low barriers to entry, doesn't encourage monopoly, and in fact has been the vehicle in country after country, including the United States, where new entrants can challenge the monopoly. I would say voice over IP and I, I, has probably been more effective than the Telecommunications Act of 98, in demonopolization. Why? Because it's made it possible for a challenger who doesn't own a network to challenge the income. So it would be ironic to regulate it in the name of protecting us from monopoly when in fact voice over IP itself is in, um, has an effect of breaking down monopolies. Finally, social issues. And these are social responsibilities. And it is important that services like 911 continue to work. It is important uh, that CALEA and other law enforcement access continues. Those are problems that are being met 
by the voice over IP industry. Over the years, my company carrying mainly international calls has had many, many requests from law enforcement. There's never been a legitimate request that we haven't been able to meet because of the technology. And we continue to work with law enforcement, as is our responsibility to make, and the industry does, to make sure we can meet those requests. On 911, we can do a better job than the traditional service. Why? Because we're integrated with the internet, because we're internet, integrated with graphics, because we have all the power on the internet. On access to the disabled, we can do much, much better uh, than traditional PSTN. But if you regulate voice over IP, if you put it into a broken access charge mechanism without first reforming the access charge mechanism, we're not asking that we not pay our fair share, we're just asking that the system be rational and technology neutral. If you do those things, you slow down the social benefits of voice over IP. It won't stop. It's too beneficial to stop, but its benefits can be slowed down. You hurt the competitiveness of the United States because other countries have followed our lead, have deregulated, demonopolized, become much more competitive. They're not going to follow us if we go backwards. And so at a time when we're worried about the competitiveness of the United States, it would be a huge mistake to cripple ourselves by regulating and taxing ourselves into a position where we're non-competitive. And finally, if you <coughs> regulate to meet the social needs, and the social needs do have to be met, the regulators have to make sure that the social needs are being met, that's a very legitimate role for the regulators, but if you regulate before there's a need, what you're going to do is regulate the past. What you're going to say is, voice over IP, you have to emulate the PSDN. Not you have to meet the real goal, give the disabled a much better access that you can give them with the full power of IP, but you have to look like a telephone. That's dumb. So we will get the benefits without regulation. We are getting the benefits without regulation. These are thorny issues. It's going to take a lot of time this year. Uh, thank you all for listening to a very fast five minutes. I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Ann Boyle, who is a um, public utilities commissioner of the states, um, uh, has a huge role traditionally in, in regulating telecommunications networks. Voice over IP challenges that role in a number of different ways, both by the way it affects the, uh, the current universal service fund, but also by its very nature. Uh, it makes it much more complicated to know what's an intrastate call and an interstate call. And so for the perspective from the states, I'd like to ask uh, Ann Bolt to talk about what she sees as both the opportunities and, and the risks and the problems. Ann? Thank you. As I mentioned, I'm from Nebraska. I am a public service commissioner in my state. We are elected, just like the members of the Congress are. And in my state, uh, and it varies from state to state, we are able to take campaign contributions from carriers. And I bring that up because um, all of you, I know, are contacted by lobbyists uh, probably every day, and they give you their varying uh, opinions. In my state, it happens as well. And I want to tell you that it is, I can see how you get drawn in to those arguments. Uh, I also feel, as a, an elected official, while I listen to them, I represent the end user, the person who pays the bill at the end of the day. And with that, I want to just take this opportunity to tell you, because these issues are very complicated, and I've heard things, I think that the industry is, um, uh, maybe paranoid is too, much, too heavy, but they anticipate what we're doing, instead, instead of sitting down and listening to us and saying, what shall we do to work this out so it is in the best interest of the, of the country. And with that, I want to just ask Brian Atkins, who is with the National Association of Regulatory Commissioners, to stand so you know who he is. Because, go ahead, Brian. <laughs> um, he is the, the Washington representative for the states. And as you have people come to you and ask you questions or ask you to make a decision based on this, the states in 1996 were given the job of of unrolling and unfolding the, the Telecom Act 1996, and it was very complicated. That resulted in a highly trained, efficient staff, and we, I think, can be considered the subject matter experts on telecommunication issues. Every state has a public utility commissioner or a public service commission, and if you take the time to either call Brian or look up on the internet, Public uh, National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, it will take you by state to that commission and all you have to do is call and ask for the telecom department and they will be happy to give you what I consider an objective view 
uh, of what is taking place in front of you and not to, I'm not maligning lobbyists at all. That is their job to, uh, and they have a responsibility to represent their client, uh, to give you their perspective from their view. But when we became partners with the FCC on implementing the act, we became the people who I think uh, can provide you the information that you need to take this issue, that issue, and try to sort out all the details. And believe me, they are very complicated, I'm sure, as you're already picking up from the discussion that's taken place so far. Um, there are questions that we have as states, and I would encourage you to not feel like you have to read, run headlong into the making a decision as to what we are going to do or not do. And I would encourage you not to say that somebody is taken off the table today because uh, the technology that we're talking about today, if I'm correct, was not even mentioned in the Telecom Act of 1996, only eight years ago. It is a constantly changing environment, and I don't know that we can expect to rewrite the Telecom Act with any certainty that that is going to be the end of it. I think, frankly, I've been told, and I've been given numbers between the year 10 and 30, that the first telecom act that, that we have, the one in 1996, really the genesis of that began 30 years ago. And so from 30 years until 1996, uh, we have a huge change. We are not going to get, I don't think, a tele an omnibus app that is going to address all the problems that can anticipate a changing environment of technology in the future. And so I would encourage you not to be swayed by we're going to solve all the problems in, in one bill. The discussion today is so it might be eight years of doing that. Uh, and I don't know that, that by the time that is finished, that they are going to have all the answers, just as we did not have them in 1996. Um, there are questions today as to whether or not we are hung up on the technology and trying to, uh, when we're talking about any kind of oversight or regulation. And wondering if we might not consider thinking about, rather than saying it is the technology that we are trying to get our hands around and to decide, and to decide what we're doing, should we think about the function of what it does? And if you are using your voice to communicate with somebody, should it be, we should we worry about whether or not it is um, uh, over a voice over internet, if it's wireless to wireline, if it's wireline to wireline, or what it may be, because we have no clue what we can be seeing in just a very short time with technology. Um, I'm checking to see if I'm over time yet. <laughs> um, at any rate, the biggest issue that we see right now, and it's been mentioned already, is the loss of universal service funding. Everything that we have right now that we've been talking about, wireline to wireline, wireless, wireline, uh, even voice over internet protocol, <coughs> at some point it, is, it usually touches the public switch network, which is the local telephone companies. And so in order to ensure that they are continuing to be made whole, and I come from a very rural state, I live in Omaha, but uh, there are some places in my state where you can drive for an hour and not see a single car. And so that kind of gives you an insight as to how difficult it is for these very small rural companies to provide service, and they don't have enough customers. I mean, one, one company we have has 87 customers. There are not enough customers in the area to provide the income, so that company will remain whole and be able to continue to provide, provide service. And so universal service funding and how that is going to take place and who is going to provide what and unraveling what is an interstate call or an intrastate call, and I frankly wonder if that can be unraveled, but there must be some compensation that continues to uh, feed the, universe, the Federal Universal Service Fund, and so that we can continue to do what was required of us, which is to provide health and service across this nation to as many people that we can. And with that, those are my just my opening comments, and uh, I'm sure we'll be asked questions later, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Next, I'd like to ask Rick Zimmerman, uh, who is the uh, Senior Director of State Telecommunications Policy for the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, to come up. Rick is a longtime veteran of uh, a number of discussions on telecommunications uh, between the states and the cable industry. The cable industry is a relatively new entrant. They started entering the uh, telephony market after the 96 Act, um, but with voice over IP providing a more economically efficient way 
uh, for cable to do it, particularly since it is the, uh, the, the leading uh, pipe by which homes in America get broadband. Uh, everyone expects that cable will be much more aggressive in this area in the next couple of years. So Rick, can you tell us about cable point of view on this? Thanks, Blair. Uh, I guess I shouldn't take it personally that a number of people just got up and left the room mm -hmm. when Blair was introducing me. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I want to thank the uh, Internet Caucus uh, Advisory Committee for having me here today to talk about what cable industry is doing. We are very excited with VOIP and what's, uh, what's uh, quickly coming in terms of uh, broadband and related areas. But I want to start out with a shameless plug, and that is that uh, as you know, uh, many of the industry folks did one-pagers, and this is the uh, NCTA one-pager, which is found in your handouts, but Tim told me that uh, we could not hand out uh, anything else. So I did want to offer the shameless plug for our white paper from which the one-pager is described, and it is available on our website at www.ncta.com. And I think uh, when you read it, you'll see that we have brilliantly anticipated uh, most of what's in the FCC's recent uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. And I am going to give you now, uh, in five minutes, I'm going to give you the short version of the paper. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't go and read it, because there's a lot of uh, excellent little tidbits in there. But I did want to give you a little flavor of what we are saying on the policy side in terms of uh, VOIP. Let me first differentiate slightly what some of the cable companies, I think, are doing from uh, from what some of the other folks in the VOIP space are doing. The first is that we view ourselves as facilities-based competitors. Uh, we are out there with, uh, with a uh, wire into the home, and I think that is uh, not the case for many of the other providers, which is not to say that ours is better or worse or whatever, but we think that, uh, that part of the promise of the 96 Act was uh, that there would be true facilities-based uh, competition for voice, and uh, we think that uh, in large measure we will be the first to really provide, be providing that on a mass scale. Uh, we have focused, I think you'll hear a lot about various features and interfaces and things like that. We've really focused on a, uh, uh, a price uh, sensitive model, an all you can eat uh, local and long distance model, uh, offering a service that uh, has robust 911 capabilities meets all of the uh, requirements for uh, of, uh, law enforcement and provides a QoS or quality of service that uh, we're not sure could be matched by others. Importantly, our service does not travel over the public internet. So when you hear VOIP, the IP internet protocol is just a transmission methodology. It doesn't necessarily mean that it travels over the public internet and our service will not. Uh, we have companies like Cablevision that currently throughout their entire territory of 4 million homes past uh, now has a facilities-based offering available, the largest facilities-based deployment uh, in the country for VOIP service. Time Warner has rolled in Portland, Maine and Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, just about to roll in Texas. By the end of this year, they will be offering service in almost all of their major markets. They pass 18 million homes. They have 11 million subscribers. Uh, to me, that's quite amazing that they'll be able to do that within uh, one year. But to get into the, uh, the, the, um, the guts of the paper, let me tell you what we're saying. A lot of the discussion, not so much here today, but as you talk to people about VIP, has been, is it a Title I information service? Is it a Title II telecommunications service? Uh, we don't think that's the most important issue. We recognize that the FCC, at the end of the day, has to do something uh, that, that fits within the statutory framework. And, uh, you know, depending on what the courts say, maybe it will take them many attempts to do that. But, uh, but the statutory framework is important. Maybe the statutory framework will change. But in terms of how it looks right now, the debate has been, is it number one? Is it number two? Uh, we really view it as, I started out, well, it's something more like a 1.5. Uh, the more I think about it, it's really more like a Title 1.3, a little closer to Title 1 than it is to, uh, than it is to Title 2, but not quite just Title 1, because Title 1 uh, doesn't really apply the responsibilities and rights that we think are important for VOIP service. And that's what our paper really focuses on. In fact, the title, Balancing Responsibilities and Rights, a Regulatory Model for Facilities-Based VOIP <coughs> Competition. So we really have looked at the various responsibilities that are out there. I think it was touched on by all of our previous speakers. 
look at, and, and I think you can sort of divide into economic regulation and public health and safety and other kinds of regulation. I think there's general agreement that economic regulation is generally not necessary for VOIP service. In terms of responsibilities, in our paper, our industry is stepping up to the plate saying on all of the major, what I would call the five major sets of responsibilities, uh, we agree that either voluntarily or mandatorily they ought to apply. And that is uh, working with law enforcement, providing E911 service, access for the disabled, and in terms of the two major funding obligations, universal service and intercarrier compensation reform, they need to be fixed, no doubt about it. The FCC has open proceedings on both. We expect more proceedings to be opened. Congress is talking about some of these things. Uh, but nonetheless, under the current system, our, our companies are, are paying both uh, into the Universal Service Fund, they're paying access charges. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't think that it needs to be reformed and sooner rather than later. But we're stepping up to the plate on all of those responsibilities. But there are a number of regulations that should not apply. And those, uh, in terms of a broad look, would be the kinds of responsibilities and regulations that were conceived in an era of monopoly utility provider status. That's not to say that these responsibilities or regulations only apply to what were formerly monopoly providers. Because in some places, for example, they are applied to CELEX, the competitive local exchange companies too. We don't think they should, but we know the focus right now is on VOIP. Just as one example, it's not the most important example, but it's a good example, would be call detail on your bill. My friends in the wireless industry tell me it takes, uh, it costs about three to five bucks to provide you all the call, call detail every month on a paper bill. If a company is offering you an all-you-can-eat plan, $39.95, and an additional call costs you nothing extra, then there's no reason to have all those calls listed on the bill. It's available typically on the web, a web detail, but no reason that those billing requirements, for example, ought to uh, apply. Certainly, consumer protections of general applicability should apply, but again, those, and we list some of the things that shouldn't apply. It's not an exhaustive list, but the general theory is if it was um, developed in an era of monopoly status, uh, it probably shouldn't apply. Uh, rights, my time is probably running out. Let me say something quickly about rights because I think no one really is focused on the rights that are necessary for VOIP providers. Maybe that's because we're in the facilities uh, space and others are not, but it is very important that we have the right to interconnect and exchange traffic efficiently, the right to access the E911 databases and other resources to provide E911 service, the right that we are able to receive compensation as appropriate for terminating traffic to our network, assuming at the end of the day that there is a compensation uh, mechanism, uh, the, the right to be in the rights of way, uh, ducts, poles, conduits, etc. The key is that all of those things normally come with Title II telecom carrier status. What we are saying is even if at the end of the day this is not a Title II service, those rights must apply in order for VOIP services uh, to be robust and to come out there. And finally, there has to be a way to distinguish between those services that should and should not be regulated. We offer a four-pronged test in our paper. Uh, we think it's a good test. It's probably not the only test. But the key is that there be an easily understandable way so the provider doesn't have to go to the FCC and ask for a declaratory ruling. I don't know why I'm looking at you, Blair. You're not FCC <laughs> anymore. But you don't have to go to the FCC and ask for a declaratory ruling in the first place and say, hey, can I offer this service? How is it going to be treated? That you know up front with certainty it is or it is not regulated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, and now Link Owen. Uh, Link is the, the Assistant Vice President of Verizon, and uh, probably has been on more VOIP panels than any other person in America um, uh, per, to provide the view of the uh, incumbent phone companies. Link, go ahead. Now that you're going to say instead less. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of slides here. It's, are they on? t -Dust? And if we don't have them, I'll uh, describe to you what I want to talk about. I think you were. Uh, there's two things I think that are important in this discussion that I wanted to cover. One is the policy questions and then why you as legislative policy folks should care about VOIP. They're, on the policy questions, uh, some of them have already been covered, but the purposes of regulation is one of the key issues we need to think about when we're looking at technologies, new ones like this. And the three purposes have already been mentioned. That, that usually you regulate for a dominant player in the market. Usually you have some regulatory policy because of universal service support and to protect consumers. And in this case, at least in two of those instances, uh, in, with respect to dominant carriers in particular, there is no need for regulation. And when I say regulation, I'm talking about economic and rate regulation, entry regulation, the types of typical business regulation that we've applied to the traditional telephone market. 
I do think there's one issue that's important for you, though, as legislative uh, policy people, and that is, what is the purpose of the technology? What does it do for us, and why should we not want to see heavy regulation on it? And I think the biggest reason is that it can stimulate innovation, increase choice, and competition. It, it, traditional regulation tended to do a number of things. Well, one of them is it did uh, encourage a market and a network that was reliable. It did encourage uh, telecommunications to get out to people so people had a wide uh, availability of telecommunication services. But what it also does is drives things down to a least common den denominator. You tend to have the type, same type of service, the same type of feature sets were in all the switches. All the intelligence was in the network. The telephone company ran the whole thing. So basically, you didn't get a lot of differentiation. You didn't get, get a lot of innovation. You got a lot of reliability, and there was investment in technology, but it was largely to provide the same service, maybe even more reliable over time. So one of the advantages of this technology, if we don't regulate it and let it uh, be diverse and let it grow, is that you can get innovation, choice, and new kinds of options. This is an example of what I mean. <laughs> if you look back in the 1970s, this is an ad that the Bell system was running. And it says, you want choices, Bell's got them. People are holding all different kinds of phones, but the service was exactly the same. The feature sets were exactly the same. You didn't get a lot of innovation and a lot of variety in the technology. This is an example of a technology that, in fact, did advance. This is the cellular technology. And when it started out, that was the first one of the first cell phones. It was a 30-pound a battery. You got a half an hour of talk time. That was it. If you look today at the feature sets you have in, the, in both the devices and in the network, there's all kinds of variety. And the companies are differentiating and they're being able to market their services based on the different types of services they offer. They're not all offering exactly the same thing. You've seen the Verizon ads with the uh, guy saying, can you hear me now? One of the reasons we do that ad is because we think we can differentiate our service based on quality. We think we've done enough to invest in the quality of the service that we can, in fact, sell it. And, in fact, that's one of the reasons that people buy the service. And there's all kinds of feature sets that people are offering, too, including today broadband. We're now beginning to offer a service called EBDO, which is third-generation broadband cellular service, to differentiate our service again. All of this was possible, I submit, in large part because companies were not regulated. They were able to take a chance, invest, grow in new kinds of services, invest in different types of technologies. <clears throat> What's really making uh, VYP more and more available and more possible to get is in large part because of broadband. Uh, in the early days of, of the technology, it was pretty uh, new and it didn't have a lot of feature sets itself. It wasn't very good at quality. Broadband allows a platform that's always on. It allows a high quality connection. It's very high speed both directions. It overcomes a lot of the early problems you had with a modem, which in the early days was not duplex. It didn't go both ways very well. So today, what you have is a technology that has been moving up the technology chain and improving over time. Started in 1995, you essentially had a hobbyist toy. I went to the, some of the early conferences that uh, Voice on the Network had in the 1996-97. Basically, it was a toy. People used it. It was a software thing on your, t on your computer, and it wasn't very good, a lot of jitter. But today, as it's moved up the chain, it becomes more and more of a technology that works. International bypass was one of the first uses. It wasn't really that good then, but it was still getting better. Then it became a long-distance bypass technology. Dialpad was one of the first ones that you may have used if you've ever used some of these computer-based VOIP technologies. Dialpad was one of them. It was basically just long-distance bypass. It was a free long-distance service that you can get on your computer. Now you have companies like Vonage offering a combined package, local, long-distance, and so forth. And I think in the future, you're going to see even more functionalities with VOIP, including two-way video, potentially, and video conferencing, those kinds of things. So to conclude, what does this, all this mean? I think innovation and stimulating innovation and new choices and new network technologies for people is important. So we support most of the uh, comments that were made already about not regulating it heavily. We also understand and believe that the social obligations are very important, so we still have to have 911 functionality. We've got to address issues like Kalea, which is wiretap and those kinds of things, and the SEC is, in fact, looking at that now and universal service to make sure that there is uh, a platform for this technology to run it. Because one of the things that uh, Tom Eslin said, which is very important, is that a lot of these companies do not have networks. They may have a server. They may have uh, some uh, equipment they give you to get the service. But by and large, their service rides on top of a network. So the network itself remains important. So universal service funding remains important. And I'd also submit compensation for competing calls on the public switch telephone network remains important. That means some kind of access charge or some payment for taking the call from the VYP provider over the public switch network to a consumer remains important. I agree that we need reform in that. In fact, we're moving in that direction, but it's going to take some time. So the issue is going to be, in the interim, VYP providers need the public switch network. Most people are still going to have a public switch phone. They're not going to have a VYP phone in the, in the near future. So you're need going to have some kind of access charge compensation to keep the system going as we have today. So I think in the near term, that's important. We have not argued for access charges for anything that stays on net. In other words, anything that's on a broadband connection stays on a broadband connection, goes IP all the way to the other end. We don't ask for any access charges for that. So our position essentially does encourage 
investment in broadband and IP. Because if you stay on IP and stay on a broadband network, no access charges would apply. It's only when it goes on the public switch network. Thanks. Okay, I'd like to um, uh, just start off with a, a question to, to all the panelists, because I think it's at the heart of what a, what a lot of the policy debate is. And then after, after this first round, we'll just open it up to questions. And the question that everybody touched on is universal service. And, and I guess taking Link's number, let's assume we do get 70% broadband. And let's, let's assume that Todd is right that uh, VOIP lowers the price. Uh, for everyone so that the need for universal service uh, on, on some kind of affordability scale goes down. We still have the problem that we have 30 percent of the country without access to broadband, and therefore the, the, where VOIP isn't really viable. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, you're taking a lot of the traditional subsidies out of the network, so the cost of providing it to that 30 percent goes up uh, significantly. So the question is, what kind of, tr is there a transition plan or do we need kind of a bifurcated plan uh, for, for how we continue to make sure that the traditional networks are still in operation while we're transitioning to a new network? Todd, do you want to start off? Yeah. The, um, yes, there is a transition plan needed. Uh, first of all, even if there weren't voice over IP, the funding for the Universal Service Fund is in great danger. As you described, mobile bypasses it in some ways. It's impossible to force businesses to subsidize it because they can substitute their own networks. And so the traditional subsidies for Universal Service are just broken. So given that there's a need for Universal Service, there's a need for, uh, for reforming the mechanism that money is raised for Universal Service. Voice over IP is certainly part of that equation. Voice over IP providers, at least as represented in the Von Coalition, and that's a lot of us, believe that we should be paying into universal service. We're not asking for any kind of exemption. What we're saying, though, is that the funding mechanism has to be reformed both to save universal service um, and to make the funding mechanism um, technology neutral. The funding mechanism was developed for old technology, as you described, just doesn't apply to the new technology. So an example that would work um, is c consumers now pay into the Universal Service Fund indirectly, but they do it on a per minute basis for residential long distance calls, basically. Um, and this w one proposal, which would work, it's not the only one, would shift the funding to a per line basis. So if you had a phone number, I'm um, oversimplifying, whether it was an IP phone number, well, no matter what kind of phone number it is, then you'd pay so much a month. That doesn't get in the way of the innovative plans that are flat rate, um, doesn't discriminate, and does, and it would be the same for a mobile phone, it would be the same for any kind of phone that you had. So I think that would put universal service on a sustainable basis. The one thing I'd like to challenge, though, is that the cost of providing universal service will go up. I think, actually, um, that it goes down because uh, the cost of providing any kind of service goes down with VOIP either in the network or in the endpoints. So it's not that there I think there'll be less people that need a subsidy, but let's disregard that. The service itself becomes less expensive to provide, um, and so we can provide it more effectively with less money. If we slow down the growth of the technologies that make universal service cheaper, then obviously the funding doesn't go so far. Let me take just one more point because it's very important, Dan. The people who are left, and you talked about them, they will be, you know, for years people left using ordinary telephones. The assumption that they can't benefit from voice over IP is absolutely wrong. Those people are benefiting from voice over IP today. It doesn't reach all the way to their residents, but because voice over IP is at the IXC portion of the diagram that you drew, because it's in the middle of the call, voice over IP is reducing the cost for them. That gets us to what's today's greatest debate. People say very easily, and I agree with this, that the free world dial-up case, the pulver.com case that you talked about, is very easy for the FCC. If it's computer to computer or, or um, IP phone to IP phone, it doesn't touch public switch telephone network, so it doesn't pay access charges. Uh, and if it's on a phone and it looks like a phone, it should pay access charges. Uh -uh. Because if voice over IP is in the middle, then it's already saving money, f or potentially saving money for the people who are making the call. So the 
consequence of saying if it's computer to computer, it doesn't pay access charges. If it's phone to phone, even with voice over IP in the middle, it does, is to say that those people who don't have broadband, either because they can't afford it or because it's not available in their area, they're the ones who have to support the Universal Service Fund. But anybody who's rich enough to be able to afford broadband or lives in an area where it's available, they don't have to support the Universal Service Fund. And that's backwards. So it's not, it, it, yes, the people who continue, there will be people who continue to have ordinary phones. Uh, we, have a, we should have make very sure that that doesn't last any longer than it has to, but we don't want to disenfranchise them from the benefits of voice over IP. We want to reform universal service so everybody pays into it and those who need it can benefit from it. Well, there's just so much of it uh, that comes into what has been said and that, um, first of all, I want to tell you something. Look on your telephone bill someday. Did you know one of the first charges on there is a charge that was imposed to pay for the Spanish-American War, and it is still on there? So the government does uh, sometimes uh, add charges. Sometimes people say there's no tax that's ever been imposed that's been taken away. Well, there's one that's never been taken away. Bottom line is I'm concerned because, again, rural areas, like has been said, only 30 percent of our nation, but in one place in my state, the cost to provide a telephone telephone service from from where the central office is to the, the customer is five hundred dollars a month. Now multiply that across this nation and see what the kind of dollars that we are talking about. And yes, that's an extreme, but but that does occur. And I'm concerned that the investment that it takes for uh, carriers to provide the types of services, these new age services that we're talking about, the last place they go there go is to those areas of the country because they are so expensive and because there are not enough customers there to to recapture the cost of the investment. And there, hence, we continue to need some type of universal service, and I think it will never go away uh, because we will always have those kinds of areas. Since the status um, every 10 years shows that there is, continues to be an erosion in rural, of uh, population in rural areas. And it's something I've brought before my commission because I live in Omaha. We are the subsidy provider to the rural areas of our state because we have a state universal service fund as well. But that is not going to go away over time. And acceptance of these types of new technologies, while they come very quickly and we see a lot of people uh, latch on to them, uh, we continue to, it, it is the older population who is the last to use it. So we will see over time generational changes wherein uh, if your, you will be using perhaps voice over internet instead of the traditional phone service. So I again say that we have a difficult issue to sort out so that we continue to provide enough subsidy to those areas of the country so no area of the country is not without the technology they need to, to do well. Another kind of a social issue is this. We are seeing the overcrowding of areas. In my state, we are encouraging people to move to Nebraska because it is a good place to live and because you don't have what comes with big city living. In comparison, I supposedly live in the big city with all the traffic that comes with it. But I do think there are social changes taking place, generational changes taking place, and all of that uh, solving this problem of, tr of proper funding so we can take advantage of this type of technology, which I don't think there's a regulator in the country that would stand in the way uh, if it, of it being very successful. But I do will, will say that some of the issues we talked about and that, that are now becoming accepted, that there is an obligation to provide for uh, uh, Kalia and all the other things that have come. That discussion did not take place early on. Nobody wanted to do that. It is because government and because all of you work for government understand that there is a healthy tension between government and industry and that um, because government has brought these issues forward, the industry starts to understand they have the obligation to provide them. And it will not happen unless you are there to say we expect you t that you do have a uh, uh, obligation to ensure that we have safety measures and that your network works and that the customers are getting what they pay for. I just want to make a couple quick uh, points. Uh, um, I mean, I agree generally with, with what's been said and with the premise of the question, which is that VOIP has the opportunity to reduce the total need for universal service funding. But I do want to take issue with one of the points that you made, Blair, which is that with your hypothetical that maybe 30 percent, if 70 percent take broadband, 30 percent can't get VOIP. 
uh, one of the things that I failed to do when I differentiated our service from others is that you do not have to be a broadband subscriber to take uh, Time Warner's VOIP service, for example, or Cox's VOIP service. We'll see for our other companies how that works. But you do not have to be a broadband subscriber, unlike to get Vonage or many of the other services that are out there. Uh, you do have to be a broadband capable home. However, the cable industry alone now uh, is available, broadband, high-speed internet, uh, cable modem service, available to 85% uh, plus of the country. If you add to that the number of DSL homes where cable is not available, we're over 90% where broadband is available. Uh, you know, satellite, broadband over power line, whatever's coming online. So broadband will be available. But in terms of our services, again, to take Time Warner, just them, they've got 18 million homes that they pass. Almost every one is broadband capable. Those people, once Time Warner's rolled out, could take VOIP service without subscribing to broadband. So that's an important important distinction. But to come back to where we have focused on in terms of universal service, it's uh, it's really on the contribution mechanism side. How do you collect the money? Whatever the amount is. I mean, yes, we agree that there needs to be some, some good thinking, some reform generally on some of the other issues as to uh, portability and distribution and all of that. But our focus has really been on the contribution mechanism. Tom touched on numbering. I just want to drill down a little further on why numbering makes so much sense. Uh, the current plan, uh, as mentioned, based on interstate telecommunications revenues. Interstate telecommunications service revenues are declining. The number of numbers is increasing. Uh, as you have these all-you-can-eat plans, uh, and even, uh, I shouldn't say even, but Commissioner Boyle also mentioned uh, that it may be difficult to differentiate inter- and intrastate aspects of VOIP service. So in terms of trying to assess VOIP for universal service, you don't want to have to go in and make some kind of allocation uh, that may be somewhat arbitrary as to what portion is interstate, what portion is intrastate, and in fact, what portion is telecom or non-telecom. Numbering solves all of those issues. So we think that numbering, uh, 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 you know, has great promise for dealing with the contribution mechanism issues. We've advocated that elsewhere. We've got paper on that. Uh, let me do one thing that, uh, as, as Commissioner Boyle introduced Brian, I'm going to uh, take my privilege and introduce uh, two of my folks, Wanda Townsend and Cliff Riccio, if you would wave or stand up. Uh, two of our government relations folks that are here in the audience, and I would encourage all of you to talk to them about these issues or contact them about universal service and, uh, you know, let you know what, uh, what NCTA is thinking. Uh, so, uh, Link, if you've got any plants in the audi audience, uh, you may want to point to them as well. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, that, that's where we're going. We think we're in good shape. Available without broadband, a numbering plan uh, is the way to go. And just two quick points. Verizon has, a, out of our 55 million lines, about 17 million are in rural areas or uh, <coughs> far out, farther out suburban areas. So we understand the cost issue, and certainly there are real costs for maintaining a uh, ubiquitous telephone network. But there are a couple of things that I just wanted to make sure people and the staff are aware of. One is on the technology side. There are quite a few developments that are coming along fairly rapidly that I think will help incur uh, lower cost and make service more available more widely. For example, versions of Wi-Fi called WiMAX that uh, probably the standards will be done this year. And what happened with Wi-Fi was once the standards got uh, done, before you knew it, you had an incredible amount of uh, Wi-Fi types of products. One of the reasons these technologies in the past didn't work is because there was no standards. And today with WiMAX, I think uh, you're going to see that, in fact, you're going to have technologies that have 30-mile radius probably uh, distribution of broadband is what they have capability-wise. So that's one thing. Second, there are alternatives already in the market that are beginning to substitute for voice service. And so we need to look at universal service more globally than we have before. For example, probably close to 50 percent of the long distance calls today are made on wireless networks. Now, admittedly, wireless doesn't reach in all rural areas, but Verizon's network, probably 90 percent of the population can get access to it. So we're getting to a point now where people have alternatives. And as I said in my talk, a lot of that was because we have a lot of uh, new network, network investment that never would have been made in the old days when we had essentially one network and one type of uh, scheme, a regulatory process that managed that system. Uh, wireless basically has invested over $65 billion to build out to where they are today. So we have a huge set of essentially six separate networks that now provide service and competition in many cases with, with wireline. So the, the definition of what universal service is, what the fund ought to be, how large it ought to be, I think is changing. And uh, we need all, need all to look at that and consider these factors as we look at universal service. Okay. I'd like to open it up for questions. Is there a, I'm not sure there's a mic, but let's, first question. Well, I, my question is, 
question is, uh, what what is the potential for broadband by satellite to provide service to people in rural areas uh, for high quality or substantial quality VOIP services and eliminate uh, draw on the USF? <coughs> It probably wouldn't be very good because of the delay factor, but uh, the speed is, is good on the satellite, but it probably wouldn't be very good because of the uh, delay you still get with a satellite uh, broadband service. Is that something that uh, technology is going to overcome eventually, or is that a permanent It's a problem with the speed of light. Uh, <laughs> that in order for a satellite to be geostationary, to appear to be in the same place, it has to be at a fixed height above the Earth, uh, and it takes a noticeable amount of time for a signal to go that distance traveling at the speed of light. So for every other Internet application, web surfing and so on, it's great, uh, it's error-free, there's a lot of bandwidth available, but our ears are so delicate that we do pick up that latency. More expensive low-Earth orbit satellites can be used. The technology is harder because they're not stationary, so you can't just point an antenna at them. Uh, but And that's how some of the satellite phone systems work. But there is this law of physics that's somewhat in our way on that one. And uh, just quickly, apart from um, satellite, I don't want to uh, leave out um, some of the fixed wireless uh, setups that are out there. It's kind of a new technology versus what we had four or five years ago. Uh, I know that the FCC back in, I forget uh, uh, when exactly it was, sometime late last year, held a session on what are known as WISPs, wireless ISPs, which is a new phenomenon using uh, um, unlicensed spectrum. It's sort of like Wi-Fi on a much larger scale, different than WiMAX, but some very creative things happening out there in rural areas to bring very low-cost uh, voice and broadband services to people. So, uh, you know, I'm not as down on the, on the technology. Uh, you know, maybe satellite isn't the answer. I do think there are other things around the corner uh, besides you know, besides cable, DSL, and of course we've got the power line guys that are uh, working hard right now to bring out their technology. And I'd only like to add this, and it's a pin, maybe um, those, those at the table can, can set aside my concerns regarding voice over internet protocol. It is the internet, and uh, if, if it is used, as it's being suggested, there's going to be a telephone, you pick it up, and it's there. How, have you ever turned on your, your computer and you had to wait? The internet is always on. Unlike traditional telephone services, when you pick that up, you catch a dial tone, and then it is, the call is made, and it transfers to wherever it's going. And there is, there is a, kind of a, a tracking of where that phone call is going. With the internet, when you pick up the phone, is there a, any kind of a guarantee or certainty that, that you are not going to run into picking up the phone and then you have to wait before that call can f actually find where it's going out there in the big atmosphere and get to where the end user is or the uh, call is made? Maybe I can address that uh, because that's the only business that we're in. Um, yeah, it used to be a problem. Um, to get reliable voice on the Internet or to get the kind of reliable voice that people are used to from the phone system. Um, and a lot of technology has been developed that says if the last mile is good, because you've only got one last mile between the consumer and the network, but if the last mile connection is good, then you can provide as good or more reliable phone service on the Internet than on the traditional phone network. The, for the very same reason that the Internet is a more efficient way to move data than a dedicated network. It has so many different paths, uh, and I hesitate to say this in these times, that it's virtually indestructible. It held up much better in 9-11. It holds up much better uh, when there's an earthquake than the traditional phone system, we had to develop a lot of technology to get exact, you know, people have very high expectation, and should have very high expectation of phone service. So a lot of technology had to be developed, but as I said, 10% of international calls are going over the internet today. People don't know that, and that's a very good testimonial to the fact that the service isn't worse than the service they're used to getting. All the major carriers use us to transport their international calls around the world. They don't tell their customers these are voice over internet calls because they don't have to, because their customers are getting the service level that they expect. And they wouldn't be able to do that if their customers weren't getting that service level. Many of the calls that leave Nebraska or come to Nebraska are going and coming on the internet and we're, with the technology we've developed, with the, the, the strength and redundancy of the Internet, we're able to give you as good service, or even in some cases better service, than a traditional carrier. Very real concern, uh, and one that obviously needs watch, but one that, that we really are meeting. And 
Just to end on that, the last mile is where that connection has to be done well, hence the need for the Universal Service Fund, especially in rural areas where the cost is much higher. And uh, again, no, uh, I don't think anybody on this panel disagrees with that. I, I think that the it's very voice over IP has an important role to play there as well because the rural people need not only phone access; they need all kinds of high-speed internet access to fully participate in the national economy. Um, and there's more funding available if you're only building out one network than if you're building out two. So if using all of these new technologies, and it's, and it's exciting how many technologies voice over IP can ride over, this WiMAX, Wi-Fi on steroids, low Earth orbit satellites, DSL, cable, power lines, all of those things uh, means that there's more ways to get service to rural people and there's more revenue available to support the capital cost if that <coughs> service can be used for if that um, last mile can be used not only for data, but that very special kind of data that we call voice. I'm only agreeing with you, just with more words. We, we have a number of questions and a uh, limited amount of time, so I'm going to ask the panelists to keep the answers brief, but let's go to the next question. Well, he asked my first question, okay. so I'm going to ask the last question. And this one's actually more directed towards Rick than anything else. Um, so I'm assuming that since the cable companies are beginning to offer phone lines through the cable lines, they've been able to resolve the lifeline services issues with power outages and still being able to power phones and dial tone in case of a power outage in the area? Well, let me make a couple points in that regard. Um, what most of our companies are doing is providing a battery backup or will be providing a battery backup uh, of some sort. I think one thing you have to keep in mind when you're looking at service that are out there, people that have uh, cordless phones, for example, they don't work in a power outage. Uh, we think that the key is, one, disclosure to let people know exactly what the service is capable of doing. Uh, even the phone company's um, uh, service, you know, they're using in a power outage, sure, the phone is powered, but they've got battery backup or generators or something like that in there. You know, it's not an unlimited phenomenon. I mean, you know, if, if, if power is out for days on end, then, uh, you know, everyone's going to have problems. Uh, but our service is capable with battery backup of, uh, I think, typically it's going to be uh, an eight-hour product, a 16-hour product. There is an issue over changing out batteries as they age and making sure that, you know, just as we do with smoke detectors, uh, you change them every year or something along those lines. Uh, but we are not expecting, uh, you know, serious issues along those lines. Um, and, and again, today, everyone with a cordless phone, I think, understands that when the, when the power goes out, those phones aren't working. I, I, one uh, qualification to what Rick said, and most of our most of our lines are connected to CEOs that actually don't have just battery power. They also have generators in most cases, and so they can actually go on for days, not just for a little while. Uh, the big problem in some cases, like in the storm we had, the hurricane, not too long ago is that if you have down power lines and trees and so forth, if you can't get fuel there, then they can actually uh, shut down. But we didn't even have that problem in the hurricane last time. We were able to get fuel to them and keep them going. So we only had a couple CEOs out of about 2,000 were affected that were not running. So phone service ran the whole time. But I do agree with them on one point, and that's people's usage patterns have changed a lot. A lot of people don't even know the phone works <laughs> when there's an outage. I, th I still think it's a major advantage, but a lot of them have uh, cordless phones, and they're used to using cell phones, and they plug their phone into their car and keep it going during the outage. That's what we found is happening more and more. Rick, do you want to know? Well, sure. I mean, I, it, it depends, you know. It depends, first of all, on their calling patterns. I think that most of the VOIP, let's focus on residential, apart from business, what other folks are doing. It depends on really how much long distance call uh, you're making for our plans. Most of our plans right now are all you can eat, $34.99, $39.99, all you can eat local and long distance. Uh, there are some per minute plans. Vonage, for example, has a Thirty-four ninety-nine, all you can eat. Uh, Twenty-five ninety-nine, I think it is. Maybe it's twenty-one now with uh, five hundred minutes, and they have a limited package with about fifteen dollars. Uh, we think that for lots of customers, the thirty-nine ninety-nine is an attractive option, particularly when you remember that at least for our services, there are no additional fees. There is a, a whatever the local or appropriate, I should say, state, local, federal tax, but there's no subscriber line charge. So one thing I think you need to do is, you know, look at your local bill today. Um, you know, I, uh, we have a place in New Jersey. We have a $5.99 local plan. 
uh, from Verizon over there. But when you get the bill, and I mean, I'm not blaming Verizon here, on top of that, there's a $6.30 subscriber line charge and, uh, you know, a $0.57 universal service charge and several other charges, so it's not $5.99 by the time we're done. When Time Warner tells you it's $39.99, it's $39.99 plus tax without anything else. It's not like a wireless plan, again, for example, that, you know, you're told it's it's 39 and you get the bill and it's 50 plus. Uh, so depending on how much long distance uh, calling you're doing, uh, the more you make, the more attractive one of these kinds of plans will be. But we think even on the low end that there will be some attractive options. Question over here. Question for, uh, for Blair about the, um, the, um, the system you laid out in the beginning. You, uh, my understanding is something like Vonage works where you take a regular telephone and plug it into an IP router and that goes over the internet. Is that more like a phone to phone over the IP or is that more like a computer to a phone? Um, in, in terms of the way the FCC is looking at it, it's, it's kind of categorized more as the, I'm sorry, is there a mic? Oh, oh here you go. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's more like a computer to phone. It is using a regular phone, but it very quickly goes on to the broadband pipe and very quickly is um, uh, trans uh, essentially transferred into internet protocol. It never, uh, it never touches the PSTN on the callers in, but it often touches it at the end. But just to make, make a point about your question, there are also free services. For example, the pulver.com, computer to computer, there's another one called Skype, which if you d download software and I download the same software, there are versions of VOIP which are free, which raise additional questions about the economic viability of things like universal service. Uh, yeah. Um, this technology will enable people to route problems that, as we know, are having trouble tracing who is actually spamming because of the way they're routing it from the internet. Is this going to create a problem where people are going to be getting pornographic phone calls into their home during the dinner hour? And, you know, obviously, what can we have a problem dealing with that on our email account? How, is, you know, how does this affect things? What's being done to prevent that from being an issue now that we know that can be an issue in advance, unlike with uh, email technology? Does, uh, I, w I would assume, Link, you would probably know the most. <laughs> uh, he, yes, you would know but the most about pornographic spam. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I spend all day studying that. Yeah. Um, I, it, it, these are the kinds of issues with technologies like this you do need to look at. Um, certainly there's potential for, um, uh, for, mass, mail, for, for, for mass sending of uh, voicemails, for example, to people. That's possible with this technology, sure. So we're going to have to look at those issues, sure. Yeah. I don't think uh, in the near term with people having a phone number or some kind of identifier that uh, that's going to be a real serious problem. But yeah, you could have a voice, voicemail box that gets filled up with stuff on it, sure. Well, let me just add, I mean, it's I, I haven't thought very much about this problem or quite frankly at all, but um, but I know the Vonage service, the service that Time Warner's offering, offers caller ID. Uh, and so I think just as, I mean, I don't think you're going to get uh, you know, if you've got caller ID blocking, for example, if it doesn't have some semi-legit number attached to it, it's not going to get through in the first place. So, I mean, I think it's something we'll be able to overcome, but again, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. We're going to, over think, time, going to offer a managed network anyway. It's not going to be on the, on the public Internet. It's going to be, initially, we're going to have a, a public Internet offering that's going to start in April, but eventually it's going to be a managed network, so it'll be a private network, so that in that case, we can control it. And such, what we're going to move to as quickly as we can, but you've got to do some investment to make that happen. Cable is going to be largely in a private network, too, because most of theirs is on their own private backbones and their own private connections. So I don't think there you're going to have that much of a problem with it either. But And most of these are going to operate like standard phones. Uh, it's not going to be a computer-type service. In other words, you're on your computer sending all kinds of voicemails and stuff that way. But So I, don't, I think for most, uh, because of the managed network aspect, of it, I think we're going to be able to control a lot of those problems. We have time for one more question, I think. Well, I, I think that the primary difference was, again, that our service is over a private managed network, not over the public Internet. I mean, I don't disagree with Tom that the public Internet is pretty darn good these days, but uh, I was just at a presentation with uh, a guy, uh, Bob Mercer, who uh, used to do a lot of work at the FCC and elsewhere, and most people call the public Internet best effort. Those packets go out there, and, um, and uh, this best effort is... Uh, they, they try to get where they are, and if there's a problem, they sort of keep sending. Uh, he referred to it as send and pray, 
which I thought was a good, uh, a good acronym. You hope those packets get there. Usually they do. On a private managed network, as we are going to provide, we won't be the only ones. I mean, you know, Verizon said they will. I think other providers will do the same. You can think of it as an HOV lane, where those voice packets are prioritized. They kind of have their own path, and here's all of the other um, uh, data traffic that's flowing, and they're kind of segregated over here to make sure that they are prioritized in, in some way. So that's one aspect of facilities-based. But let me give you a couple of others, and, and you know, this is not, you know, to, to denigrate the, the way that other people are doing things, but, for example, on, uh, we think on E911 or Kalia, um, we have already, I mean, eight of the nine punch list items that phone companies have to do we can do right now. Um, there's one that can't be done. We don't think it's technically possible. Uh, we've told that, the FBI that. We said if you can figure out how to do it, let us know. Can't do dial digit extraction where someone punches in credit card numbers after they make the call. But we can do all of the rest and we can uh, provide a more robust E911 than someone like Avonage can. And they acknowledge that. That doesn't mean they're not going to solve those problems. But I think at least initially it makes a difference. You should take with a little grain of salt, with respect to my colleagues, the claims of the private networks. Not that they don't have them and not that they don't manage them well, but remember they're all going to have to connect to each other. Uh, because you're not going to only say one of your subscribers can only talk to other no. subscribers. And I know you know that. But that set of connections in the end adds up to being the Internet. Now, they do provide, uh, I mean, for providing E911, for providing the local services, for making sure that that critical last mile is good. There is an argument for facility-based provider, and I didn't mean to get into that, but there's no way that calls can be useful and restricted to a single network, and I think everybody would agree to that. With that, I'd like you to thank the uh, panelists. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.